Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our spoiler review of the season of Ted Lasso. Today, we're diving into episode uh, 10 of season two, No Weddings and a Funeral. This is a spoiler review episode of Ted Lasso. Those of you who've been watching our reviews, thank you so much. You know, they've been increasing in views every week, so I hope more and more of you are finding us and enjoying what we're doing, so appreciate it madly. I'm one of your hosts. I'm the outlaw, John Roke, and I'm joined, as always, by my fellow geek buddy and my lover, my fellow lover of Ted Lasso, uh, Shannon McClung. How are you, brother? Woo! This yeah. one, a lot of feelings. A lot of feelings watching this one. I, I imagine most of your audience knows because they probably listen to Geek Buddies as well. But, you know, yeah. I lost my dad last year. Right. Uh, and so the idea of funerals, um, it is a little fresh. Yeah. So if I happen to collapse in a puddle of blubbering emotion, I apologize in advance. <laughs> well, well, hopefully you make it through, brother man. But yeah, like I said, if we if you if we you need to collapse, you don't worry. You're in good hands here with the Outlaw Nation. You know, I went through this uh, in 2008, 13 years ago. So it still can be it can feel just as fresh as it did the day it happened, uh, and it can also feel as distant as uh, uh, as 13 years. You just never know. And certainly, this episode was really well done. If I can go first here. I really enjoyed and appreciated this episode. You know, the, the, the season, Ted Lasso has been taking some punches in the gut here from critics and from uh, former fans uh, who have really been upset about the second season of the show. It's so ironic. This is all happening as they're winning Emmys, as they're winning all these awards for that first season. We get a whopper of an episode here in episode 10, bringing so much emotion. Uh, you know, when they teased that someone was going to die. I think a few of us speculated that it would be Rebecca's dad, and that is exactly what happened. Rebecca's father passed away. Deborah tells her the news, uh, and we get into the whole idea of death and what it means, and it affects certain characters. And uh, there's three pretty, three pretty main storylines that roll through this. It is, uh, it is Rebecca's uh, dealing with the death of her father, having her ex-husband show back up having this come to Jesus moment with her mom, having Flopsy there for her support along with Nora. And then we have Ted and this funeral triggering his feelings about his father, which we've been building towards through numerous episodes in this season and him reaching out to the doctor to have a conversation, to finally have the conversation with Dr. Fieldstone about um, what happened uh, that day uh, that his father committed suicide and how that affected him going forward. Uh, and then also Roy and Keeley and Jamie Tart, just as I suspected and was worried about Jamie Tart rolling up in this B doing his thing. So uh, kind of uh, we're going to get to all those uh, storylines and talk about it. But overall, I really enjoyed it, thought they handled it really well. And I thought to myself as Ted was having or Jason Sudeikis was having this fantastic scene with Dr. Fieldstone that they gave him the Emmy one year too early. I feel like this is the season where he really earned the Emmy. And this scene itself is where he really earned the Emmy. If he gets if he gets it again for this season, uh, it'll be because of this uh, episode, in my opinion. And we'll see where the Roy Keeley uh, and Ken, uh, Roy, uh, sorry, the Roy Kent Keeley, Jamie Tart storyline is going to bring us. And what happens with Rebecca and Sam, even though they're taking a little bit of a break. Shannon, what did you think overall on this episode? how they dealt with the passing and then how everybody else was affected by the passing and having to go to a funeral. I mean, I thought, I thought it was excellent. I thought, yeah. I thought it was so, so well done. Um, you know, it's, it's, it starts off so nice and then very quickly things, things go sideways yeah. again, having been to my own dad's funeral you know, fairly recently. Um, there were so many, there were so many parallels to what happened here. I mean, those, those moments of uncontrollable sadness, yeah. juxtaposed with uncontrollable laughter like you cannot you can't explain why something has tickled tickled you the way it has but to see that mirrored in um in the episode was uh was uh i don't know if i would call it entertaining for me i mean <laughs> but it was very it definitely struck a chord um yeah. and acting wise was it cathartic maybe cathartic maybe to watch this in a way um i i think it's too recent to provide okay. any real catharsis okay um because you know ted goes into what to his father yeah. as well and and um one of the one of the uh for lack of a better word pluses 
um, is, and, and I will try not to digress too far, um, mm -hmm. but one of the pluses about my relationship with my dad is that I didn't have any of the, there, there was no baggage. Right. Um, there, there, there was nothing left unsaid. We had a very good relationship. Yep. It was very sudden. It was very unexpected. Um, but knowing that he didn't have to suffer at all, that he basically got the wish of most people when they, when you think about how, how you're going to pass away, that he essentially went to sleep and just didn't wake up. Yeah. Um, so looking at the more complicated relationships that Rebecca and Ted had with their own fathers, there was definitely a feeling of, if I didn't have that relationship with my dad, then this, this could have, um, hit more of an emotional chord than it already did. Yeah. Um, but acting wise, every, yeah, I agree. I mean, Sudeikis fully earned that Emmy that yeah. he won for season one. I know there's been some talk online that uh, so, some, um, so, some, uh, 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 some, some critique mm. of, of how the winners played out. I, I uh, you know, I, I think Jason Sudeikis earned, earned that award mm. overwhelmingly. And watching his work this season, depending on what comes out between now and next Emmys, I'm like, he, he might be making some space on his shelf yeah. for a second. Yeah. And even though you did have those very emotional moments, you had some very funny moments. I mean, Danny Rojas in this oh, episode, yeah. just so, so funny. You had some very sweet moments with, uh, with Sam. And, yeah. you know, we get the return of, of Sassy. And even yeah. though I don't... Um, agree with her behavior in a church uh, she was she i think she probably provided a level of catharsis for the audience <laughs> talking to rebecca's ex yeah. yes absolutely uh rupert got a mouthful from Poppy <laughs> for sure uh you know, Poppy doesn't have to have you know like what's the best way to deal with people like Poppy doesn't need any of that but Poppy deals with her life as she deals with her life and uh, god love her for that she's fantastic i love her as a character enjoy her whenever she shows up uh, to have some fun. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Sassy. Sassy, whenever she shows up to have some fun. I was combining Fla Flo and Sassy. <laughs> Sassy, uh, Ellie Taylor, so great uh, in that role for sure. Uh, all right, so this is, a, this is a warning here. We're going to jump into the episode now. We're going to spoil it. We don't do it like we do normal, like Geek Buddies episodes. Where we break it up into sections. This is going to be about storylines. We're going to jump into each of the storylines and talk about it throughout. I think we start with the lighter of the storylines, perhaps. Let's start with Roy Keeley and... Uh, and uh, 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 Roy Kent uh, and Keeley and Jamie Tart here uh, seemed to be that uh, Roy was like being a little bit weird about how he was dealing with this with the death situation here, and then you had Keeley kind of get, taking it super serious and wanting to be buried in this biodegradable sack so she could be maybe part of a tree and people could eat the fruit off of her tree. And Roy, of course, is like shooting that idea down. And to him, they're, when they're all sitting around. After they've heard the news in the coach's uh, office, uh, or manager's office, rather, Roy is just like, you live, you die. He's just in a coffin. He's just in a drawer. It's no big deal to him. That's how he's learned to deal with death. And we find out later, after Jamie Tart has revealed to Keeley that he didn't just come back to Richmond to play and to save his career. He also came back to try to maybe get Keeley back as his girlfriend, tells her he loves her, uh, which stuns Keeley. Uh, and just then Roy walks up and kind of apologizes for how he's been. And he reveals something of himself that his grandfather passed away. And he spent a year uh, praying for his grandfather to come back or to have or to speak to him in some way. Uh, and he realized that that's uh, what inspired him to embrace life and, and live it to the fullest and uh, not miss an opportunity. And he tells Keely he loves her. He apologizes for being weird. So interesting here, uh, uh, Shannon, we've got Keely in the middle between these two guys. One, she had a former relationship with one. She has a current relationship with, but both of them are around the team. So, uh, I mean, this is something we speculated about early on in our reviews. Why is he coming back? Why is Rebecca giving him that look, giving her that look? And now what do we think after Jamie Tart has revealed himself to Keely and do you buy the moment between Keely and Roy at the end to kind of uh, wrap up their storyline for this episode. I mean, Roy Kent's outlook on death mm. is not unique. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of folks have this, kind, don't necessarily have a, um, uh, 
spiritual point of view mm -hmm. that that they don't necessarily believe in that higher power that you know the the cycle of life is we're born we live we die yeah and that does not make that that does not make that type of person bad it's just like this is this is how they see the world and but it can be misconstrued as being a little callous mm -hmm. and like that's that. certainly that's certainly how Roy's outlook was presenting itself, especially to Keeley. That that um, you know, at the end of the day, like you're there is there is no soul. Yeah. That that it's like you, you're 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 a you're a human you're a human body, and once you're gone, you're gone. Like that you you cease to be at that point. And you know, she's talking about being being buried in that biodegradable sack. So then she, you know her her remnants can then produce a tree and produce fruit and then you know he has that moment where he has an apple he's taking a bite of an apple yeah. in the sanctuary which again as one i mean I, i'm not catholic but i mean as one who grew up in the church i'm like that's ah, very bad taste yeah. <laughs> but you see her response to that and then he talks about oh yeah i got it outside from you know someone else's rotting corpse and it's like oh dude this is yeah. Ah, <laughs> all kinds of bad. Yeah, it's all kinds. Yeah, of bad. and then that moment with Jamie, like when they broke up in the first season, you did not. And it's been a minute since I've watched season one, but I yeah. am not recalling a true sense of regret from Jamie. Right. That this is just another another uh, notch in his belt. Right. Um, but it's not until this season when he comes back and the dynamic has changed, and he has. Um, experience some some maturation, some yeah. emotional growth yeah. that he might see, like, oh, this was this was a really this was a really good woman who who really took care of me. Um, the fact that he does approach her and uh, makes that confession that he yeah he didn't just come back to the team to play, he came right. back for her and that he loves her. He did acknowledge the fact, like, I understand you're with Roy. The guy who just comforted you, the yeah. first guy to comfort you after I'm that run with your father. Great point. Yeah. Like it's it's I don't think he was being underhanded, despite right. the fact that, that that was a very underhanded move. It's just yeah. like that's that's effed up, dude. That is not right. So yeah. the moment that Roy, I mean, and that's the thing with Roy Kent is these um 180s that he will do um that can go from happiness to anger and in this point or, or in this context um sarcasm to um vulnerable to vulnerability yeah. Yeah. where he explains like this is why i am the way i am right. i'm sorry i didn't tell you that and i'm sorry that's but i'm sorry that's how i acted this is why yeah. i mean you keely is being presented with a very unique choice um, yeah. that one will have huge ramifications for the team. And in my opinion, one won't. All right. So in terms of storytelling, I feel like I know which way she's going to go, but we'll right. see. Yeah. And you know, you could, uh, and we'll get to the Rebecca and Sam situation. Uh, that's absolutely the same thing. One decision could have huge ramifications for the team. One won't. And this is, what you look at here with this situation with Roy and Kent and Jane, uh, Roy and Keely and Jamie. And I, you know, to me, I, I, I take your point. I hadn't even thought about the fact that he had just comfort. He just comforted him after the situation with his dad. Cause that beard episode kind of made it feel like it's been weeks and now this has happened. So, um, but when you put it together like that in my head, I'm like, yeah, but you know, you know, this, uh, as you said, you've recently experienced this. Funerals can be weird. People can act really weirdly at funerals. People have, and it's not like every person in the show is like emotionally stable. Every person in the show has stuff that they're negotiating, working through, figuring it out. Roy is clearly one of these guys that has been trained to hide his emotions. And it is being with Keely that has allowed him to be more vulnerable, allowed him to speak about his emotions, maybe for the first time ever. So his first reaction to everything is defense mechanism, playful jokes, keep it at a distance. And it's really because he's actually a very sensitive soul. He's actually a very caring soul. I mean, what kind of kid um, prays for his grandfather to come back every night for a year? That's a sensitive, caring child. And that's a good thing. 
But of course, in the world, and especially in the world of Britain, that can be a tough way to live. So you develop this thick skin, this wall to push people back so you can look like you're a tough guy. Nobody messes with you. But once they get inside, the, it, you, they see who you really are. So he's still learning how to do that as a natural course of things, step by step. But at least, as you said, he's having these 180s and they're not weeks down the road or months down the road. They happen the day of sometimes or a couple of days later. And that's important. You know, so oh, and Jamie himself is changing, and I think you're right, Shannon. That scene where he's telling her how he feels, like you sense uh, from the performance that this is authentic, this is genuine. Mm -hmm. So, if it he doesn't end up with Keeley, at least his interactions with Keeley has led him to become, as he said, the better version of himself, better man, uh, and will set him up to move forward. The thing is, if he does move forward and she sees him with someone else and sees him happy, what is that going to trigger in Keeley? Because clearly she didn't shut it down and she's had her doubts about Roy at times. So does she have these possible feelings for Jamie that are still there? I don't know, man. We're going to see as it goes along because uh, what do we got? Two episodes left. So or one is yeah, two, right? Two more after two. 10. Yeah, two more episodes left. So uh, the proverbial crap is going to hit the fan. All right, let's move on uh, to the Ted Lasso story here. Uh, this was the really tough one. Uh, maybe I think for both of us or, uh, you know, uh, Shannon seeing his a reaction to having panic attack. I, I'm not I'm not lying to you. When Jason played this so well that when the panic attack was happening dude i started to yell at i was watching on the computer yelling at breathe just breathe just breathe just breathe just breathe you'll get through it just and it was so real because i have had to experience panic attacks for the last five years of my life for the first time ever in my life understanding what that is and breathing how essential breathing is jason played it so well it was so believable so real and then calling Dr. Fieldstone, having her come over, having them sit um, in the in his disheveled living room and having this conversation about his father, about the anger he felt about what his father did, calling him a quitter. Uh, him, he found he heard the gunshot and found the body, which is almost doubly worse than someone just finding the body. She, he's the one that called his mom. And told her he had, she had to come home. So he took on this responsibility. But he feels such anger towards his father for what he did to his to him, to him and to his mom. And Doctor Fieldstone Fieldstone receives all of that, and then gets Ted to talk about the things that he loved about his father. And he tells this beautiful story about his dad staying up and reading an entire novel overnight so he could tell his son on the car ride to school everything about them. Essentially, giving them the clip notes, the Wikipedia. Uh, so that he can pass the test. And so that almost felt like a bit of a breakthrough. Then Ted shows up and sings along with Rebecca to her uh, eulogy <laughs> there uh, and has a great moment with Rebecca and Deborah at the end there before he gets on the bus. Uh, or before, well, sorry, before he leaves with Sassy. So uh, what did you think about how they played this whole storyline with Ted out and us fleshing out a little bit more of uh, Ted's experience with finding his father who had committed suicide? I mean, I, I have never experienced a panic attack, so I, I oh. only have uh, yeah. my friend's recollections and Hollywood to go off of. Mm. And it certainly seems like they're they're playing it very genuine. Like this yeah. is something this is something that would it just seems debilitating. Like it's paralyzing, you, bro. Yeah, yeah. You just kind of almost go catatonic. Like yeah. you can't you can't move, you can't speak, you can't think. Yeah. Um watching uh, Dr. Sharon with Ted. Um, and, and again, the, the moment that as he's talking about, um, how he found his father, mm. how they intercut that with Rebecca yes. talking oh. about her dad, oh. um, just so brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, brilliantly directed and brilliantly edited. I mean, this is a, a sequence like that is a true work of collaboration that you have everyone um, at the top of their game putting a sequence like this together because even though this is a comedy, like we know it to be a feel good comedy and they've definitely gotten, they've hit upon some more uh, dramatic themes this season. Um, talking about the loss of a loved one, um, it's delicate yeah. and it can come off as disingenuous and 
at least from my very limited experience with having lost lost a loved one, again, this seemed very honest. Yeah. And it's 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 a it's a uh, difficult needle to thread as a performer because as performers, our inclination, our instinct is to push. Yeah. And from watching both of these performances in real life, that's not how it would be. Like these right. are these are especially these two characters. Um, they're difficult things to talk about. They're they're going to come out slowly. And then once that dam is kind of broken, they are going to come pouring out, but they're going to come pouring out in a non-performative way. Yeah. And so watching how uh, uh, Ted and Rebecca both spoke about their fathers. I mean, the whole sequence was just, was just so well done. Um, yeah. I mean, Ted Lasso is just such a, he's such a great character, um, especially from where it started. And, and, and I'm, and I'm speaking from where it started as from the audience's point of view, right. that this seemed like it was going to be, again, we've talked about this before, a silly little comedy about an American coaching a European European football club. Right. And it is it has it has become so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean maybe less so the funeral sequences, but maybe this there was some catharsis like watching yeah. watching both of them uh watching both of these performances. Yeah, I agree. And you know you gotta give a shout out to Jane Becker who wrote this 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 episode she has written for Harley Quinn. Uh, she's written for Super Mansion, The Simpsons, uh, Final Space, and Rick and Morty. Uh, and so she's one of the producers of Ted Lasso as well. And she wrote this episode, credited. And there's such a deafness to this dialogue. There's such a light touch uh, to this dialogue, even though what they're talking about is very heavy subject material. The way it's presented, the way it's navigated, is done with such an authenticity that she deserves a lot of credit for the, what she was able to construct here in these scenes. I'm sure, uh, you know, when you're tackling something like this, a storyline like this, or a moment like this, scene like this, rather, you want to make sure you are writing as much as possible, but also writing it as bare as possible so that you find the truth and the authenticity in the exchanges. And you got that. And, you know, as I said, having done panic attacks, having had panic attacks myself, um, they are absolutely catatonic, absolutely debilitating. And you just, you, time disappears. Honestly, time disappears. You have no idea how long you've been catatonic. I remember I was out for three hours one day, just, just staring at the ceiling and time literally disappears until you can finally feel normal again. It is in, an insane experience uh, to go through and see him being like just the position he's in, the hands in the head. Yeah, and you want to like offer the tea. You want to be as respectful. Like he's just in that place. And, sh and Dr. Fieldstone, having been in therapy myself as well, having her navigate him out of that place, having her talk about some, you know, receiving his feelings, receiving the negative uh, feelings he has about his dad and what his dad did, and then also turning it around and starting to get him to talk about the positives. That's how you start to heal. And that's and that when I lost my father, it took me three years to finally come around to appreciating the time I did have rather than focusing on the time I lost. And it was only uh, when I finally started remembering all the good times and remembering all the stuff that I did have with him that I started to fully heal or start the process of healing, uh, uh, losing your dad. And so hearing her navigate or watching her navigate him to that spot here in this, because obviously you can't do three years in the show, but having, having her navigate him to that spot in that conversation, I think was really powerful and really positive yeah. to see him show up at the church uh, and have just do what he did. I thought was great. So, you know, and you're right, Shannon, it doesn't say who directed it on IMDb, but the decision to go back and forth with this, that could have easily become maudlin and it didn't. It actually accentuated both of those scenes, gave them even more power as they were both remembering their situations, both shocked in different ways by the actions of their fathers. And ironically, on the same day, at least I think that's what they're implying. So pretty crazy. Um, 
All right, so we'll see what happens, how much further this affects Ted as the next two episodes go along. They've made a very strong point of highlighting it this season. Let's move on to the main storyline, which is Rebecca's storyline here of obviously losing her father, finding out from her mom, Deborah that she lost her father. While Rebecca is, um, in essence, yet again in the kitchen. Well, I guess she wasn't in the kitchen the first time Deborah walked in where a guy was uh, half naked in the kitchen in his boxers. But this time it's Sam instead of Luca, and Rebecca is there as well. Uh, and she tells him, and uh, we have this conversation. And so she has to go through the whole process of being a part of the funeral. She has the conversation with her mom uh, in that uh, uh, rectory, I guess, about her dad cheating on uh, her mom and saying that she hated her father for that betrayal uh, and finding out that uh, the, Deborah knew the whole time that her husband had been cheating on her or the, or the dalliances that he had, but she was all, she also loved him and she also like saw the best in him and loved how much of a great father he was to Rebecca. And then we get this whole like Rick Astley storyline playing throughout the episode of her, of Deborah's love of, of never going to give you up, which I think, I think this episode Shannon may have single-handedly recaptured the Rick and roll away from the Rick and roll people and turned Rick Astley back into something a little more respectful, which I thought was really <laughs> surprising. Um, we see Sam, the Sam and Rebecca thing. I mean, they're living in this fantasy land that they can just like, Sam really wants to have Rebecca come forward and they can be open in their relationship, but there's dangers here. People were worried that Nora, when Nora find, found out she might turn on Rebecca, instead she calls her a, 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 a boss, a bitch ass lady or something like that, uh, right in front of the priest. Um, so now we find out what's going on here. And Rebecca has a really powerful uh, uh, exchange with her mom that leads to this eulogy where she kind of stumbles initially and then goes back to lyrics of never going to give you up, which really restores her and takes her mom's advice in dealing with Rupert, who has shown up to the funeral, kind of putting that baby in her face. And Rupert ends up saying that I'm going to give you my shares or your, your his, his uh, young wife's shares for Rebecca to have in the club for Richmond. So that's a lot, but she's the main storyline. What did you think about how they handled all of this and how Hannah Waddingham uh, acted throughout this episode? So I want to go to the shares first because yeah, that's sort of the side note because after Rupert appeared to have so graciously just yeah. given the shares of his, his young wife shares of the club to Rebecca, then we see him whisper to Nate. What is that all about? He has shares in another club, and he oh, is trying to poach Nate. Dang. That, that is my guess. That's I don't think he... Uh, based off of the character's behavior in the earlier episodes from season, from season one, this is not a guy who's going to do something out of the goodness of his heart. Right. Um, even though like he is a father now, and he has a daughter, like you still get the sense that a tiger doesn't change their stripes. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that the best way to get back at the club that is no longer his is to support another club and to uh, uh, and simultaneously uh, hurting Richmond as well, which would right. be to take away Nate. Um, with Hannah Waddingham, again, who fully deserved her Emmy Award, yeah. Um, yeah, from the beginning, you know, it's, it's so weird with, with these relationships because we're in a new, we're in a new day and every relationship has their complications and yes. has their challenges. And part of that, that's not to say that you can't date someone or be with someone 20 years, your junior or 20 years, your senior, but there are going to be complications that come along with that because Especially if you work with that person, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. And that's a whole other layer. I mean, but just with age difference, I mean, your worldview is different. Right. Um, so as you know, we, we open and we see Rebecca and Sam in bed together and it looks so serene and so sweet. Um, I still can't get over him. Like he looks so young. He I looks know. like a kid. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's not to say that a relationship like that couldn't work, that you have one partner who is who is a, a bit older um but it's going to be there are going to be challenges and there are going to be complications um 
Hannah Wanningham just did such a great job, um, mainly thinking about the speech that's intercut with Ted's speech, but also yeah. uh, the eulogy. But when she and Keeley are in that rectory mm -hmm. and they're so loud, and then Sassy joins them, and then their mom, and then Rebecca's mom joins them. Again, as one who grew up in the church, I'm like, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 it, and it comes less from a point of view of that's disrespectful. It's more that someone is going to come in and you are going to get in trouble, <laughs> which is ultimately which is ultimately what happens. Right. Um, by the time that Rebecca gets to that part where she tells Sam that, you know, this they she needs to take some space that she doesn't feel she doesn't feel like this is going to work. Um, Sam is just such a pure, wholesome character because even though you get the sense from their date that this he will he will pursue like yeah. he will he, he will go after what he wants, but if she throws up that roadblock, he's not. This is not a guy who's going to become a creepy stalker. This is right. a guy who is going to respect those wishes and respect those boundaries but he's not going to stop being who he is and that is the person that rebecca fell in love well right. we won't i guess we won't say fell in love yet but potentially right. has has fallen for certainly um, developed feelings for yeah oh 100 100 um i it the the title of the episode obviously it's a playoff of four weddings and a funeral right. um but and, and is that episode title is that just a play or is it speaking to something within the episode that no right. weddings that Roy and Keeley aren't going to work out that right. Sam and Rebecca aren't going to work out? Right. I don't know. I mean, it's it's it, you know it's it's a little tinfoil hatty, which you know we have significant experience with. <laughs> um, but you wouldn't think you'd have to put it on with Ted Lasso. But in this situation, it seems like they're kind of kind of. Uh, uh, forecasting that these relationships are doomed and it makes yeah. me sad <laughs> sassy and ted is that is that doomed as well i don't know yeah pretty sure uh but you know we within the con uh, uh, to go back to the shares thing you're absolutely right to point that out i didn't think that he was i wondered why he was talked about i didn't get as far as thinking that nate um is going to be poached i certainly mentioned in one of our reviews a few weeks ago that i thought he was just going to leave and take another job that is a rival of Richmond. So maybe that comes to pass, but with Rupert's help. And, you know, for those of you who don't know this, um, in, in any uh, English, uh, sorry, in any uh, club, a football club, there is a rival. There is a natural rival in every football club. Uh, and it's different all around there. For Liverpool, it's Everton. For, uh, uh, for Tottenham, it's Arsenal. And so they call them derbies. And those are just the heated, and you play twice a year twice a season, and those can get real heated. So Richmond naturally has to have a natural nemesis somewhere in that league. I don't know if it's in the Premier League or if they're down in the championship, they're there. So maybe that's a, a club that uh, Nate is being brought to, the rival club, and that club may, in essence, try to stop Richmond from being promoted to the Premier League. So it could be very interesting how that plays out. But did you notice about Nate also, he's wearing the tan suit, the brighter, the gray rather, the, the lighter colored suit than everybody else. His hair is grayer too. So what does that mean? Uh, are they doing that to kind of alter his look to make him look like a manager down the road when he does take over? I wonder. So very interesting changes in here. Uh, what did you think about the, 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 um, the players as well, kind of having to dress up in the suits and the whole thing with uh, um, Cristo Fernandez with uh, Danny Rojas's struggle with his shoes, I thought was really funny. That that played out really, really well. Um, and what did you think about all of that? Uh, you know, I thought it was really sweet. And I thought it was in keeping with the characters that, uh, again, not knowing a ton about European football, um, but thinking that these guys don't wear dress shoes. Like, you yeah. know, they are, they are training all the time. And so the fact that they would only be in their cleats, they would only be in trainers, they would only be in sneakers, that make that makes perfect sense to me. And yeah. that when you are a, a footballer, um, that there is a little bit of celebrity that goes along with that. So at an event, they're not necessarily going, you're not going to get dinged for yeah. wearing 
uh, sneakers with the suit. You're like, oh, look at look at how cool these guys are. But at a funeral, like you have to like you can't wear you can't wear your bright red Nike trainers. Like you right. have to you got to put on dress shoes. <laughs> um, watching Danny Rojas try to negotiate walking around in these shoes and having Jamie Tart help him around like he's an infirmed little old man. <laughs> and I mean, what super, super funny. And then you see at the end, he's got those bathroom slippers, oh. hot pink animal print bathroom slippers. I think that is the that is the kind of much needed uh, levity in yeah. an episode like this, because yeah. even though you do have humorous moments with Rebecca, you don't you don't get a ton with Ted more towards the more towards the end with the Rick rolling. Um, but you you need those moments of levity yeah. to to kind of to kind of break up your story. I mean, and it would be one thing if it was kind of over the top comedy, but it wasn't like this right. is perfectly in keeping with who these characters are. And um being respectful of of the environment as well yeah yeah and of course we get that one last uh one last thing i want to highlight is the uh exchange between sassy and rupert like that's a pretty pretty strong exchange from sassy as you mentioned in a church full-on wishing for his death every day full-on admitting it and then telling him to f off and die at the end of their exchange so a pretty <laughs> strong statement by sassy about her feelings about rupert and and like you said shannon just when we thought he might have become a little magnanimous uh, talking about his daughter, all that nonsense. He does have that stuff with, with Nate. So Sassy's going to have even more ammunition, I think, in this situation. And if she ends up with Ted, having Rupert poach Nate under Ted's uh, uh, management uh, could instill, I mean, could, could inflame her even more, rather, against Rupert. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, certainly possible. I mean, the thing, like, I, I don't know if Sassy... I don't know if she'll become a regular in season three. Or, I wish she would. I like her a lot, man. It'll be interesting to see which way the which way the story goes because mm -hmm. there's certainly a world there, there. There's there's an angle where that makes sense that she yep. becomes Ted's significant other um, and the complications that arises from that right. because you're dating you're dating your boss. It's basically you're dating your boss's sister. Right. Um, and even though he and Rebecca have have an incredible relationship there 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 is a there can be an awkwardness from that situation because yeah. it, at some point where does her her loyalty lie where does sassy's loyalty lie can ted can ted come home from a tough day at practice and yeah. vent without yeah. worrying that though that those uh those uh gripes are going to get back to his boss mm -hmm. um you know the thing with nate is and correct me if i'm wrong here but there's no world where he can be poached that he is not fully complicit in. So oh, yeah. if, if he chooses to yeah. um, basically uh, give in to this temptation, to this, you know, this the glory in the yeah. pursuit of glory, like he gets to be the manager of his own club. Yeah. Um, but you can also see a, see a reality where he is poached away. He chooses, he chooses the glory v yeah. versus loyalty and he's maybe even a little compromised in the new position yeah. it's not it's not the it's not what he was promised like right. he 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 isn't the guy he right. it, rupert poaching him away he, he, rupert's intent is only to hurt richmond right. it's not to use this guy right right well yeah and the other side of this is with ted is if he does get together with sassy sassy has a daughter so in mm -hmm. essence he's kind of he could be as becoming a stepfather to Nora. And how does that affect his relationship with his own son, who we saw in the pictures there, you know, before he has the panic attack, uh, to kind of make sure we still remember that he has a, a son. Uh, and how's that going to affect his relationship with his ex-wife and all of that? So it could be very interesting, a lot of conflict to jump into season three if if they become a significant, uh, I mean, say if she becomes a significant other and they become a couple, there could be some real drama to explore here. And remember, this is only going three seasons. They've announced that very clearly. So uh, we'll see if that actually becomes the case with this show. Um, but because it's a lot to kind of throw into three seasons and we'll see if they can uh, land the plane or score the goal, so to speak. We shall see. Uh, <laughs> um, where do you anticipate we're going next as we wrap up this review, man? Where do you think we're headed over these next two episodes? I mean, I think, I think Nate is gone. I, th I think that I think him going to work for Rupert or for Rupert's new club is totally going to happen. 
I have to think, I mean, this, this love triangle of Keely, Roy and Jamie is going to come to a head yeah. and my, I know what I want as an audience member and I know what I think they'll do as a writer. And I am not nearly as good at this as Vogel. He is, he is superior in every way in terms of structure that he can look at something and be like, this is probably what they're going to do as an audience member. I want Keely to stay with Roy right. um, for more fertile story, uh, more fertile ground story wise. Um, she either chooses no one and just breaks yep. up with Roy right. or she chooses Jamie. Yeah. And that will, that will break my heart, especially after watching Brett Goldstein's Emmy in the acceptance speech. Yeah. Um, which, uh, you know, quick side note, watching his Emmy acceptance speech, I'm like, oh, my God, he doesn't talk like Roy Kent at all. He doesn't yeah. have that natural that natural gravel. I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> he's brilliant. He's yeah, brilliant. So many, so many people are surprised <laughs> by that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and in terms of Ted, like, gosh, I don't know right now. I mean, it seems like he has crossed the bridge in confronting those demons from the past. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I don't think he's done. I mean, I think I don't think there's a bow on his story yet i think yeah. there's still there's still still more ground to cover i just don't know what that ground is yet yeah and i appreciate that the that the uh the show has turned ted into kind of uh the voice box for some for a number of people who do view suicide as quitting who do view people who do that as selfish uh who do get angry at people who do that if they have family members or friends or what have you who've who've taken that who've made that decision and we're watching him come to terms with it we're watching him slowly but surely kind of expand his point of view on this. And hopefully they land in a, in a place where um, there's more understanding about what happened and less judgment. And I think that's, that's the healthier approach to this. And I hope that's where they arrive and land. I think that would be essential for a number of people who might be watching the show and feel just like Ted feels, um, which I appreciate, honestly. I appreciate that we're the, the that they're dealing with this, and I think this episode did a really great job of showcasing what uh, death can be like when the death of a family, or what grief can be like, uh, and it's full. Of the, and the day of the funeral is always full of weird stuff that it goes on, um, and people that get on your nerves, and people that really kind of are there for you. You run the gamut, and if because you're you're never more raw than you are at a funeral, I believe, when it's certainly someone that is a dear loved one of yours, and there's unresolved stuff as we saw with Rebecca. So uh, I like that Rebecca's taking some strong uh, movements. We're probably going to see Keely make a strong decision and Ted make a strong decision as well about what they're going to do. And then eventually Nate. So it's going to be interesting, dude, for sure. And of course, Coach Beard brought Jane along, which was really sweet there on the phone, which was so weird as well. So there you go. Um, all right. Well, that's our, our review, ep our spoiler review episode. Uh, or sorry, our spoiler review for episode 10 of season two of Ted Lasso. We hope you enjoyed it. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow me on social media, on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung. And on Instagram, it's Shannon the Geek Buddy. There you go. That's it. You just said, I'm sorry. I should have just said, Shannon, where can they find you? There you go. go <laughs> so John and I literally just recorded yeah. Geek Buddies right before sorry. this. So we're, we're kind of fighting against, uh, uh, fighting against muscle memory right now. Right. Um, yes, that's where you can follow me on social media. You can see me every week with Mr. Roca and Mr. Mike Vogel on two episodes of The Geek Buddies, our normal uh, weekly show that comes out on Wednesdays or Thursdays, mm -hmm. and our spoiler reviews of What If. Yeah, What If as well. We, we might have a spoiler review of Visions coming soon as well, Star Wars Visions, so look for that from The Geek Buddies as well. Uh, you can follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Over on Twitch, you can follow me, The Outlaw Nation, all one word there, talking to Twitch about possibly hosting some of these NFL games on Amazon Prime on Thursday night. So look out for a possible uh, update on that. And maybe some of y'all who are sports fans who are watching this might join me for those watch-alongs of those games. Certainly a great game happened this past week with Carolina going 3-0. and Surprising, surprising. Uh, and also, what? oh, and please subscribe to the channel down below and hit that bell button so you see when we're dropping all the content we got going on here on the Outlaw Nation. And if I can, a little schmodown note. Text or uh, tweet Christian Harloff and tell him I want my last match. Hashtag one last ride. Tell him. Tweet at him. All right, that's it. Uh, much love to you all. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you next time with another brand new review episode here on the Outlaw Nation. Take care.